Greetings, and welcome to your Victorian Age PowerPoint. Like other periods we've been talking about, uh, the Victorian Age is one that has both um, chronological and geographical boundaries. You know, it's, it's a historical period, but it's also a frame of mind, a way of looking at the world. And like other periods that frame, uh, like other periods, that frame of mind is some is complex, and often contradictory. Um, it's really a lot more complex than we can deal with in a 15-minute PowerPoint. Um, but we're going to try to do our best. And and basically, I'm going to focus on that complexity on on the Victorian age as an era of contradiction. It's fairly simple to date the Victorian age. We simply uh, date it according to the 64-year period of the reign of Queen Victoria, the Queen of England, who gives the age her name. Uh, strictly speaking, we might limit the period geographically to Great Britain and its colonies. But more broadly speaking, um, we, can, we can reasonably apply the Victorian age to Western Europe generally and, and even North America. The Victorian Age um, gets its name from Britain um, because Britain was so powerful during this time. Politically, the Victorian Age was an era in which Britain dominated the world, much the way today the United States dominates. Britain had colonies and exerted political influence in India, Africa, the Middle East, Australia, China, Canada, South America, um, so that uh, the Queen of Victoria very famously said herself that um, the sun never sets on the British Empire. This was an age of imperialism, and Britain benefited significantly by exploiting people and material resources of these regions, and it was able to do so in large part because of its unrivaled naval power. The Victorian age was also a time of great shifts in cultural values, particularly with regard to religious belief. As the 19th century progressed, um, religion faced greater and greater challenges. Um, first of all, early in the 19th century, even in the end of the 18th century, you started to get geological findings that were suggesting that the Earth was much older than it um, was thought to be. The Bible suggests the Earth is about 6,000 years old, and geological findings uh, were starting to suggest uh, that the Earth was perhaps billions of years old. Um, so this directly contradicted um, the Bible. The Bible itself was starting to be looked at in a new way. The so-called German higher criticism looked at the Bible not as a sacred scripture or the Word of God, but as a series of documents assembled by human beings, therefore subject to error. And they um, devoted the, the higher critics devoted a lot of time to trying to disentangle who was the historical Jesus, for example from um, from the more uh, supernatural Jesus that is depicted in the Bible. Um, so this was a, a new way of thinking about about scripture. Um, and then you get you know thinkers like Karl Marx, who you see to the far right there, um, who basically said, not basically did say that, Religion was the opiate of the masses, a very severe criticism of religion. He was arguing that religion is used to um, convince people not to rebel against the powerful. It's a way of, of tricking people, fooling people into accepting their own oppression. Uh, Charles Darwin, who wrote a few years after um, the Communist Manifesto, which of course is Marx's great contribution, to Western culture. Uh, Charles Darwin came out in 1859 with The Origin of the Species, um, which I'm sure you all know uh, advanced the theory of evolution. This, like the geological evidence, also contradicted the Bible. The Bible states that, um, you know, God created the earth in six days and created man, basically uh, human beings and animals, um, as complete species all at once. Um, Darwin's theory of evolution turns that around and says that you know all species, including man, evolved slowly over a period of time, over millions of years. Um, it also basically suggests, states, that man is not separate from the animals, but man is an animal, is a species of animal. And um, this 
This was one of the three uh, great blows to human pride uh, identified by Sigmund Freud, uh, who is down at the bottom uh, of our three gentlemen. Up at the top is Darwin, then Marx, then Freud. Um, Freud said there were three great blows to human pride. One was the um, heliocentric theory, which we've talked about in previous classes. The other one was the theory of ev theory of evolution, and um, you know the last was his own notion of the workings of the unconscious, the idea that we are not in control of our minds, but that we we are driven by unconscious that is desires unknown to us. But more specifically, with regard to this slide, what Freud had to say was that God was simply a fantasy, a childish fantasy about an omnipotent being that was based really on our childish misunderstandings of our own parents' powers, and he thought it was best, the most mature thing to do was to leave God behind. Now, Freud really comes at the end of the Victorian age uh, and uh, is a transitional figure into the modern age. Um, I'm calling this slide The Sea of Faith because Matthew Arnold, who you'll be reading uh, about in Culture and Anarchy, talks about the Sea of Faith. Uh, he compares faith to the ocean, uh, slowly withdrawing from the land. I mean, he was very troubled by, by this, um, and like many Victorians, searching for something to replace the retreating sea of faith in God. The Victorian age was a, a period of time in which the Enlightenment really bore fruit in terms of technology and industrialization, uh, both for the good and, and the bad. Um, uh, for example, uh, you see the development of the invention of the telegraph in the 19th century and uh, the creation of steam engines, which um, uh, weren't just used to operate railways, though, though they were, but also were used to um, power machinery, right, like in factories. And that leads to mass production. And mass production leads to greater wealth for the nation, but it also, uh, and greater resources and prosperity, but it also leads to a, a, a certain exploitation of, of the lower classes who are themselves almost turned into machines uh, and the use of things like uh, child um, child labor for example um, but on the brighter side you also have the the invention and development of things like photography and anesthesia and so it was an exciting time to live much like our own they were seeing great advances in technology and uh, progress, uh, technological industrial progress, and those things had both their light and their dark sides. The Victorians had a great love of romanticism uh, and the romantic poets, and you can see this in books such as Father and Son, where the, the writer Edmund Goss talks about how as a child he was drawn to the works of William Wordsworth and, and Percy Shelley and Coleridge, um, but the problem was that um, in the wake of Darwin, the Victorians could no longer view nature as benign. Darwin's theory of natural selection emphasized the notion of survival of the fittest. He and other scientists revealed that whole species had been wiped out. Um, that, nature, that in nature the law of the jungle prevailed. This led the Victorian poet Alfred Lord Tennyson to write of nature as nature read in tooth and claw. The Victorians saw the world as a dangerous place where one had to fight to survive. But at the same time they wanted to hold on to both the morality that came from religion and the tranquility offered by romanticism. The solution, at least for the middle class, was to split off experience into two realms, public and private. And these realms became uh, encoded by gender. The idea was that the man went off to work into what you might call the capitalist jungle. You know, maybe he was um, running uh, one of these factories or managing some sort of colonial resource, but he, he struggled within the capitalist framework, did what he had to do to earn a living, to uh, maintain his family. But then he would come home at night uh, to an ideal atmosphere, or at least that was the, I the idea, the theory, to an ideal atmosphere uh, created by the woman. Uh, who would turn the home into um, almost like a scene from a romantic poem. Uh, and women were thought of at this time as kind of the angel in the house. She kept herself pure um, in terms of morality 
and tranquility while the man was the one who fought in the jungle. And you can sort of see this in the picture we're looking at here, how the woman has created uh, this um, ideal situation for the man to come home to. Um, they're in their house, but it almost looks like they are uh, out in a field somewhere. The Victorian era was one of strange um, and interesting contradictions in culture. Uh, for example, uh, it was a time when the British Empire, you know, was ruthlessly exploiting colonies all over the world, dominating other nations uh, for the sake of their resources. And yet at the same time, in Great Britain itself, there was a rise of liberalism, uh, as seen, for example, in the gradual expansion of the vote at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, you know, a relatively small number of men were able to vote. By the end of the 19th century, uh, that number had grown uh, tremendously. It was still only men, by the way, at the end of the 19th century. Women didn't get to vote um, in England until shortly after World War I and about the same in England, excuse me, in, in America. Um, on the one hand, you know, there was this notion in England of social Darwinism, that is to say that, um, that every man has to look out for himself um, in the world and uh, that the government should not get involved in regulating business. At the same time, there was a gradual rise of the welfare state in institutions such as um, the workhouse. But the workhouse itself was a, a kind of a contradiction. For those of you who um, may recall Oliver Twist, right? The workhouse was a place where you sent not just orphans, but um, uh, men and women who were out of work. And the idea was that you weren't going to let them starve. You were going to give them um, a place to live and, and food to eat. Um, and that's sort of the good part of it. The bad part of it is that they separated the men and the women from each other, even when they were married, separated families from their children, put the children to work, put the men and women to work in, in very unpleasant circumstances. And the idea was that you would make this place so unpleasant that the poor wouldn't want to go there unless they really had to, right? So it's this sort of curious combination of liberalism and Darwinism. Um, uh, likewise, um, you know, you see um, terrible instances of child labor in the 19th century. Uh, children being sent to factories, children being used to clean chimneys and do other sorts of dangerous, uh, awful work. Uh, but at the same time, you have a gradual rise in the literacy of the nation. One of the greatest contradictions of the Victorian age is that, you know, the Victorians were known for their kind of sexual prudery um, you'll hear anecdotes about them, for example, covering table legs to be more modest or calling um, breast meat white meat uh, rather than, you know, having to say a word that might make somebody blush. You know, and at the same time, in, in Victorian culture, there was this vast sexual underworld. There was, um, uh, at least according to one statistic uh, I've come across, you know, one in six women in London was a prostitute, and there was massive uh, distribution of Victorian pornography. Uh, pornography as we know it today really began in the 19th century in the Victorian world. Um, so there were these, um, uh, it was, it was a, a world much like our own in some respects that um, was progressing nicely along some of the Enlightenment principles, and yet at the same time uh, was turning in on itself uh, in some destructive ways. The Victorian era ended with the death of Queen Victoria in 1901 and the um, coronation of um, uh, King Edward, who gave his name to the next uh, era of about a decade, the Edwardian era. era. And that era was um, marked, among other things, by its rejection of the Victorians. Uh, the Edwardians rejected Victorian seriousness and prudery, and they, they are the ones really who were um, instrumental in characterizing the Victorians as hypocrites, you know, because that's, that's the sort of stereotype we have of the Victorian age. And despite all those contradictions that I mentioned in the previous slide, I'm not sure it's a really, it's a really fair characterization of the Victorians. After all, I think if you looked at our own age, you would see quite a few um, contradictions in the way that, um, you know, we, we are today. Um, 
That having been said, let's keep in mind that the, the Victorians uh, made great contributions to Western culture, um, not only in terms of technology, though there were quite a few of those, but um, in art and literature, philosophy, psychology, in all realms. You know, the Victorians really were forerunners of, of the moderns, of, of ourselves, and uh, they probably have a lot more in common with us than, let's say, the, than they did with previous generations. Um, so it's a complicated and interesting time, um, and um, I hope you've gained something from this, this PowerPoint, a, a better understanding of it, uh, or at least some understanding of it, uh, that will help you as we approach Victorian literature.